Okay, so I have to make sure I know which one uh, is the button. So we get to have the blessing of having the last presentation before you guys get to go to lunch. So you guys are all going to be like really happy to hear our presentation and so on. So. We're in Zyrotex, and I'm sure, like uh, Ken had said earlier this morning, uh, if you guys haven't been paying attention, we uh, are actually now Zyrotex, a Seagate company. And I have to tell you that we're very, very, very excited about the acquisition at Zyrotex. Uh, it has been probably one of the best things that's happened to us as an organization. We've been in the industry for quite a long time. I'm sure most of you guys are aware of who we are. Uh, in regards to saying the continuing power of Zyrotex, it's important to bring up that Zyrotex indeed had become a very, very powerful entity in the industry from our HDD capital equipment group, from process inspection and test equipment, supplying all the hard disk drive manufacturers in the industry. We were the leading provider of doing that in addition to our enterprise data storage subsystems and solutions, uh, as well as our high performance completing solutions for big data and cloud and geared specifically into those markets. Zyrotex had, has really become an entity to be combative within the industry and highly recognized among all of those sectors within the industry. <laughs> Okay, we want to kind of touch on and figure there might be a few questions from folks uh, in regards to Seagate as an organization. And before we kind of touch into and kind of jumping into this, is there anybody in the room who's not familiar with Seagate? Please, guys, like, raise your hand. Are you guys aware that Seagate employs 50,000 people around the world, that they are a $15 billion a year organization? They are the leading provider of disk drives and storage solutions to the industry and offer the industry's broadest range of disk drives, solid state disk drives, and hybrid drives in the industry. But more than that, they offer data recovery solutions. Uh, they are involved in the cloud with their eVault. Uh, acquisition of eVault and eVault as a solution that is incorporated within their company and is can still considered a self-autonomous kind of sustaining entity, but again is a part of the Seagate organization. Seagate has a wide breadth of what they do in the industry. And I think right now, if you think most importantly, one of the biggest questions we got was did Seagate really buy us mainly because of the HDD Capital Group and the test equipment, the process, the inspection, the test equipment we actually would do with the hard drive disk drives themselves. And obviously that was a very strategic part of the acquisition. They, you know, based on the fact that drive capacities are becoming larger all the time, the test times for these drives becomes increasingly higher as well. So it became very strategic and important to have access and uninter uninterrupted access to that type of test equipment and the leading test equipment that was in the industry. But more than that, Seagate's core competency and core mission is to supply data storage solutions, innovative and quality solutions to their customers. The adding of Zyrotex to that with the breadth of our enterprise data storage solutions as well as our HPC solutions to the industry enhances and broadens the capability of what they're allowed to offer to their customers. Do you have something you want to say on that, Peter? Yeah, I was talking to Steve Paulus last night um, over dinner, and he was reminding me that when I first joined Zyrotex in 2010, it was shortly after that that I was say saying to Steve that um, I thought that I knew a lot about storage. Working with, uh, working with the Luster team for several years, working at, at Sun and all the work that we were doing on storage at, at Sun. Um, and when I came to Zyrotex, I learned that there was, a, there, there was still a considerable ramp on the learning curve about storage, and I'm still learning today. Um, and, and that was a company where we designed the entire, um, the entire storage system around Luster, um, and, and we had that kind of capability. The, Disk drive still was a bit of a black box, and at three and a half million lines of code, it's a pretty interesting little black box. And now we work for the company that does everything from design and build the disks all the way up the entire stack. Um, and so that means remarkable opportunity to innovate. And so the engineers are just going crazy because we get to, we get to, we have a, a, a access to a lot of really cool stuff now in our palette, um, including a, a cloud company. So we've got a, we've got a cloud. We can go and we can put things in the cloud and experiment there. Um, the really, uh, one of the really interesting things, and this isn't NDA, NDA, NDA at all, you can look it up on the, on the website, is the kinetic drive. Um, and so this is a, this is a um, shingled magnetic recording drive um, with a host on it, and it attaches via Ethernet. So now we not only have the uh, understandings of the inner workings of drives, but we can now look at drives in our palette of things to make solutions out of, drives that will actually tell you exactly what object is impacted by a sector that may be going bad. 
You don't have to try to figure it out. The, the, the disk actually knows. Um, and disks that can, that can be instructed to send data across the network to each other. So when you think about sophisticated um, uh, erasure and coding techniques, data migration and things like that, we now have an awesome toolkit to build next generation solutions from. Um, and that's not something CK could have done without acquiring Xyrotex, and certainly not something that we could have done on our own. So I, I, I'm pretty excited about the days ahead. I'm very excited as well, and I can tell you again, that access to innovative technology is just going to enhance what we have in the market already and what we're able to offer. And as a part of, of Seagate, those additional resources and the collective aspect of how large the organization is and where they are going is just going to enhance what we're able to offer to the market and to you guys as well. Uh, I think you know one of the points to bring up in regards to the fact of the acquisition itself is that there was very minimal overlap on what we did as an organization and the types of solutions that we offered to the market and what Seagate was doing. So being able to integrate those solutions together and how we're going to structure that is going to mean really, really great things for the market. And from a brand standpoint, you could saw from the earlier slide, we're going to leave the systems group is going to be separate within Seagate underneath their cloud services group. Our new CEO is an individual named Jamie Lerner. And within that group, we will remain Xyrotex, a Seagate company within the systems group. The HTT Capital side will be integrated into Seagate uh, based on that test technology and the process that they'd like to have integrated into the company itself. So for the time being, right now, the Xyrotex name will stay there as a Seagate company. The structure in which we're working, the management aspect is going to stay in place, and we don't see any kind of changes in that in the foreseeable future. I will embellish and say that Jamie's a software guy. So we have a software guy running a hardware business. Um, and so that gives us some early indications. If you look at what Jamie did at, uh, um, at Cisco and, and some of the talks that he gives on YouTube, that's an interesting way to get to know your new boss is just look them up on YouTube and you can start to see some interviews. Um, and there, there, will, there is a decidedly software flair to the way that he looks at the world. So that's also very, uh, um, very encouraging. Okay, this is a very important part of bringing up what this means to the community. Really, really great things. Yeah, you heard the announcement from Ken today about the donation of Lustre.org. We as an organization are going to continue to support Lustre. We're going to continue to support development around solutions around Lustre. We just re-upped our membership with the OpenSFS as a promoter member, as you saw earlier from the slides today in the presentations as well. None of that is going to change. And Seagate is very, very supportive of what we're doing and participating in the community now. As a matter of fact, uh, Seagate as an organization is quite heavily involved in OpenStack which again is also a very community-based aspect of the going into the cloud operating systems and exactly how that's all going to be structured. So I see none of that changing. I know you wanted to say something on that too, Peter. Yeah, I, I, some of the conversations that I've had over the last year with, uh, with uh, various folks in the OpenSFS community, I think that quality and, and, and increasing quality is, is, all, is on all of our minds. Um, and the, the quality of OpenSFS releases continues to, the, uh, the releases from Intel through, through, through open, uh, sponsored by OpenSFS, they continue to get better. What we would really like to achieve um, and what we would like to um, do and work with the OpenSFS community to achieve is, is to reach the point where we can take those new feature releases and actually run them at scale in production. That, that would be a, a, a great accomplishment for us as a community um, to be able to achieve that. And it's not, definitely not easy. I've, I've been in that boat bef uh, before. Um, but um, that, that, I think, would, if, if all of, the, if all of the, top, the vendors that are working with Lustre could actually take a 2.6 and have the confidence that they can deploy that into production and it'll run without very much modification, I think that that would be a great accomplishment for us in the next year. So this is just a really quick slide to show you that our participation in the community is not going to cease. These are some events that we've already participated in as an organization beginning in March through what we know right now in 2014. We will continue to participate. We will continue to be out there in regards to luster in the community. And again, continuing to develop solutions around that. So talking real quick on some of the gross and accomplishments, you heard this morning from Ken that we grew the business over 300% in 2013. This allowed us and to go into multiple new verticals, new types of customers, from the financial industry to the oil and gas to the university marketplace, and continue. We saw high and, and continued adoption of Luster into these verticals. So Luster is growing. We are seeing growth in that aspect, not only with our own solutions, but in Luster adoption as well. 
this allowed us to hire a great number of new people in the support development areas and multiple other areas within the organization. And I know from a contribution standpoint, uh, within 2.5, which we will have integrated within 2014 into Cluster Store, uh, there were some significant contributions by us into 2.5, and I'll let Peter speak to that as well. Um, in, our, in our earlier years of development, when we were first standing up Cluster Store, we were a lot more focused from a development perspective on new features, network request scheduler and, and so forth. And, um, and we are still, um, we still, I was talking to Andreas actually, we bumped into each other in the Toronto airport. He was coming from Calgary on his way down, we bumped into each other in the Nexus line. At the, uh, in, um, at the Toronto airport and Andreas was saying like what are all your guys working on um, and um, largely around maturing the, sol uh, maturing the solution. Um, a lot of the stuff that we were doing was standing up a solution in uh, 2010, 2011 um, and in the last 18 months it's largely been around maturing. A lot more work, um, the unglorious work of, of, uh, of maintenance and fixing bugs. Um, but absolutely necessary work in maturing a, so a storage solution. Um, also, all of the tedious stuff around serviceability of the platform as well. Um, a considerable amount of work into, uh, into just improved management. Um, and, uh, and having Lustre running um, in different types of configurations, um, tickling uh, different issues that are in there, combining it with different types of client, uh, different client configurations. It's this, it's this increasing variability of the deployments that you just accrue um, out over time um, that we've really largely been investing in in the last year, just making, l making Lustre um, better for our customers. And we're very much interested in rebaselining that. That's all been against a 2.1 uh, baseline that we've, um, that we've cherry picked from, uh, from the tree, the Intel tree, considerably. Um, I have been in the situation myself where I've been trying to convince vendors that that's actually not a good idea and that they should, be, uh, they should stick to um, the releases as they come out. Uh, and there's, there's very good reasons for that because it's costly and it's time consuming to invest so much of your engineering effort in maintaining your own derivative branch. So 2.5 represents an increased um, increase in quality and accrual of all kinds of um, improvements, and we're looking forward to getting to 2.5 this year and, and rebaselining and hopefully maintaining a much smaller delta. Thank you. So, and again, you know, going into the aspect of the growth that we saw within 2013 allowed us to announce and release uh, two new products in the Cluster Store family, which was the 1500, which was specifically geared towards the mid-range market, uh, allowed companies to come in at a more adoptive level in an early stage to be able to grow and scale from there. 9000 is the next iteration above the Cluster Store 6000 that we have now. Uh, and if you'd like to hear more about that, we've got like a shameless plug on that too right here. If you want to hear more about this, come by the sponsor table. One of the, the key points to bring up to the difference between 6,000 and the version 9,000 that will be relatively available this, towards the end of this year is that each of the SSUs, each of those scalable storage units, the speed throughput is increased to nine gigabits per second uh, and basically it allows you to, uh, gigabytes, sorry, gigabytes per second, uh, and it allows you to have that additional faster throughput with each of those SSUs in the rack. I always do that with the gigabit and gigabyte thing. I don't think I'm the only one. So I put back on this slide to talk about on the horizon. Over the next couple of weeks to a month, you're going to see some new major announcements of an, some other new additions to the Cluster Store family that we don't want to talk about here at this event. Uh, but keep your eyes and your ears open on some things that are going to be happening just over the next couple of weeks to a month. Okay, how are we doing on time? Okay, so let's touch a little bit on, if you notice on this slide here and going back, Oh, back up. Okay, basically on what we have right now that we offer in the cluster store solution that we released within, again, 2013 was version 1.4 of the cluster, the, the cluster store OS. When 9000 begins to ship towards the end of this year, it will be with an even newer version, which will be version 1.5. But there were some significant added features to version 1.4 which included Grid Raid, which is, a, uh, is a, a name that we have given to this feature solution that we put within the operating system, and it was formerly known as PD Raid. Um, some of you were involved in some of the community aspects. Who's familiar with what PD Raid and Grid Raid are? Well, I only have one hand up, and you know, it did count for the people who work for our company to actually raise their hand, Torben. 
Okay, so that actually would have gotten more people to raise their hand up and so on. So significant feature on grid raid, we don't have a lot of time to talk about, we're gonna to touch on it real briefly, but again, major improvements to Cluster Store Manager, and you can see some of the benefits on the dashboard and what you're able to monitor within the Lustre environment itself. And also the added feature of what is called the SSU, our Scalable Storage Unit, plus N. And again, come by our sponsor table. We have our principal architects here with John Fergala and with Torben. Anybody not know Torben? Okay, come on, raise your hand. Nobody knows Torben? Okay. So come by, talk to these guys. They can give you some additional aspects on these feature sets. Touching on what grid RAID is very, very quickly. So in a traditional RAID 6 implementation, you know that your object storage targets are in subjugated disk pools of parity disk recovery data. Each of these pools is made up of 10 disks, so A plus 2 configuration. Okay, behind, and so you've got four of these storage pools behind each object storage server. The way that it works when you have a drive failure is the data parity disk data is striped across all 10 drives. In a disk failure scenario, the data that is striped across the nine remaining disks, the aggregate performance of those nine disks is where the rebuild occurs out to the spare drive. In a grid rate configuration, what we have done is we have effectively taken those four storage, object storage targets and effectively put them into a grid configuration of one pool behind that single object storage server. So all of the parity data is striped across all 40 drives not just the 10 drives you would have in an individual four disk pools like you would have in a traditional RAID 6 configuration. So you're reducing the object storage targets in a ratio of four to one, so that helps with any kind of scalability challenges, but more than that, your rebuild times is significantly decreased. If you think about the rebuild times and looking at aggregate performance from nine drives as opposed to the aggregate performance of 40 drives in rebuild, you can understand the difference in where you're gonna be looking at a rebuild time. So looking at a quick slide on that, and you can see this is an example using a 50 megabit per second, four terabyte drive, you're looking at 22 hours in a traditional RAID 6 implementation, where you're looking with grid raid to actually reduce that to 5.5 hours. Right. This wasn't so much of a big deal um, when we were dealing with one and two terabyte drives, but with four terabyte drives and six just around the corner, um, this becomes an incre the, the length of time that it takes to do rebuilds becomes an increasing, uh, an increasing risk to, uh, to things like double disk failures. Okay. And so there's a nice slide talking about the benefits with your mean time to recovery and so on. And again, if you guys have any questions, we've got multiple folks here from our organization. We've got a sponsor table in the other room. Please come by and ask us questions. We have pens. We have little USB four gigabyte giveaways. So come by and see us. And we're very, again, very excited about the acquisition and really think the future for our, our organization and Seagate as a whole, as well as Lester looks very bright. So does anybody have any questions? Come on, you guys. You can ask one question because you guys are like wanting to go to lunch. We've got time for one. Bueller? No? We'll are save gonna, it for two. Are you going to sell storage with Western Digital drives in it? Good question. <laughs> are you going to answer that? <laughs> It is a very good question. It's one of the reasons why I think as Seagate is very supportive of a multi-vendor type of scenario that we've had with our storage solutions. It's one of the reasons why right now Zyrotex as a Seagate company is going to stay as a essentially a separate business unit within the cloud services group. Uh, as things continue to progress, how that changes is kind of unknown at this time. Um, if you look at eVault as an example, eVault as a separate entity within Seagate actually uses multi-vendors for their drive scenarios as well. And really, to even give any more detail on that conversation, Ken, do you want to like say how that would go? Or? Thank you. Thanks, folks.